Our scripture reading today comes from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love each other, and for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in the word, in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Oh, thank you, Matt. Good morning. It is really fun to see so many people here this morning. Um, what a blessing. It's great to have you here. Um, we have just declared in song the extraordinary love of our God. We have declared in song that God looks at us in all of our brokenness, in all of our ugliness and sin, and he says, I want to be intimately close to you, and I want everything that is for your good. Uh, that is who our God is. That is remarkable. And in today's passage, we are going to um, face the fact that we are challenged to reflect that love to others. And so we will enter into that. A couple of things that I want to clear up um, or, or mention. Um, Ruth's memorial service will be a, uh, a masks required service. The family has asked that we do that. Um, and uh, so we certainly want to honor that and respect that. So uh, please come, please join us, be a part of that, but also please remember to wear your mask at the service as we celebrate Ruth's life. Um, there'll be a high number of people there that are at very high risk, and we want to, we, we want to do our part in loving them well and protecting them. Uh, and the other thing I, I do want to put my two cents in for is that um, there is nothing quite like working with a child and seeing the light bulb go off as they begin to understand a little more deeply the incredible love that God has for them. And would, would invite you as you pray about, think about maybe the Lord, how would the Lord have you get plugged in here at FBC? How would the Lord have you impact the lives of people around you with the love of God that uh, working in our children's ministry is really it's a wonderful opportunity for you to do that. So I just want to put my two cents in and, and encourage you to uh, consider that. I also want to say welcome to those who are joining us online. We are delighted that you are here. It is really a blessing from God that you can be with us, worshiping together, entering into God's word together, even as uh, we have to be physically distant. So we're thrilled that you're here and you're every bit of much a part of what we're doing here um, as anyone else. And so both to you and to all of us who are here, I want to say Happy New Year. Ooh, we're on to something there. Um, I realize that most of you think I have finally lost it, that I've been so beaten down by 2020 that I am just ready for the new year. Well, that's true. But here is why you should be Jewish. Do you realize that the Jewish New Year starts this weekend? Think about that. If you were Jewish, you'd be going, it's behind me. Rosh Hashanah is the celebration of the New Year. The Hebrew literally means head of the year, like the, the, the headwaters of a river, the start of a new year. 
and it is always celebrated in the fall. The exact dates will change, but in 2020, it hits this weekend. It's usually a two-day celebration, um, and it is a celebration of the fact that God is providing something new. It's celebrated in the fall because this is the start of the traditional planting season, and it's the start of the rain, rain season in Israel. And so for them, this is the start of the agricultural year. Kind of like we would talk about the start of a new year, like this is the start of a school year. And what they would do to celebrate the start of the new year is they would, they would have feasts of food that were all sweet. And nothing would be bitter because they were anticipating a sweet new year. And in fact, one of the prayers that would be said during this time goes like this. And listen to this prayer and tell me that we are not all praying the exact same thing. May it be your will, O Lord our God and God of our fathers, to renew unto us a good and sweet year. Uh, I can join in that prayer and I'm sure you can as well. Now, here's one of the things that's fascinating. If you, if you know the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament much, you'd be going, well, wait a minute. Aren't there other times that are New Year? Well, actually, yes. Uh, the Jews had several th times throughout the year that they called the New Year, the start of the New Year. And I used to think that was really weird. Now I think it's brilliant. <laughs> right? If, if things are off to a bad start, just wait a couple months. Because the new year starts over in just a few months, you know, no matter where you are in the year. And as I said, the reason that they had one of them in the fall is because it was the start of the agricultural year. And what they would do as part of their celebration, along with the Feast of, of Andes and uh, apple pie and things like that. Okay, maybe not. Um, they would have uh, this time of prayer where they would deeply appeal to God's mercy. They'd be looking ahead and saying, in, in, if, we do not, if you do not provide the rain that we need, if you do not provide the blessings that we need, we will be faced with famine. We will be faced with disease, death, drought once we get to the spring and summer months. So it was a look ahead appealing to God's mercy. It was also a look backwards they would take time to look back over the previous year and they would assess how have they done spiritually. They would ask the question, have we obeyed the commands of God? And they would then go to God and seek forgiveness for any of their sins against him. But it didn't stop there. They would also during this time assess their relationships with one another. And they would go to one another and seek forgiveness for their sins against one another. And at the same time, they would also again turn and look at the year to come and say, we will declare now, we will commit ourselves now that we will live righteously in this next year that the Lord provides. I think about that and I think there is some real value to that. There is some real value in slowing down, even stopping and saying, I am going to assess where I have been spiritually. I'm going to assess how I have treated one another and I'm going to make right what I need to make right. And I'm going to commit to moving forward in righteousness. And as we move through Romans, we come to a passage today that gives us a wonderful tool to do both of those things to assess how we are doing in loving God and loving one another and a basis for a commitment to move forward. So I would encourage you, as we think about today's passage, to think in those terms. Uh, it will help you assess where you need to seek forgiveness, and it will guide you as you seek to move forward. Now, let me remind you of where we are in our study through Romans. When we hit chapter 12, we hit a major pivot point in the book of Romans. Paul has been setting up, these are the truths about who God is, how he relates to us. These are the truths about what the gospel is. And because of what the gospel is, as we hit chapter 12, he transitions into saying, this is how you must live because of what the gospel is. 
And as we saw, we started in chapter 12. The first thing he says is, is that because of the gospel, we must be transformed people. We must live a transformed life. And we live that through the renewing of our mind. If we're going to be transformed, we must think like Christ. If we're going to be transformed, he continued in the next passage, we must live realistically about ourselves and about the people around us. And specifically what he talks about in that passage is we must understand that we need the body of Christ. And the body of Christ needs us. And there's a commitment that takes place as, as we live a transformed life, a commitment to one another. Then we saw that a transformed life loves with a pure love, the word that was translated as genuine love, it's a, it's a love that hates what is evil and clings to and treasures what is good. And then last week, we saw that a transformed life is a life that submits to the governing authorities that God puts in place. And we talked about what does it mean to take that command seriously, even in the face of uh, governing authorities that sometimes do not do what God has called them to do? This week, what's interesting is he's going to go back to the issue of loving one another that we saw two weeks ago. And he's going to give us first a command, and that command is, is based in a debt that we owe. And then he's going to give us two reasons that we have that debt and that we must repay that debt. And the first reason has to do with the nature of righteousness. And the second reason has to do with the nature of God's saving plan in human history. But we start with the command, and the command is grounded in a debt of love that we have for each other. And we see this in the first part of verse 8. The command is, owe no one anything except to love each other. Now, this word owe, oh, he's taking us right back to verse 7, where we talked about at the end of last week that, that part of submitting to the authorities that we have in our lives is, is to pay financially what we are responsible to pay and to pay morally and with re respect and honor what we are morally obligated to pay. And it's the exact same Greek word that he used, what you owed in those senses, we should owe to no one. But, but he's actually kind of broadening it here. And he says that we shouldn't, we shouldn't carry obligations to anyone that are left unpaid. If we have obligations to anyone, no matter what it is, we shouldn't pay them back. But the heart of the command is not here. The heart of the command, the point that Paul is making, is that we have a debt, a command to love one another. And the idea is that this is a command. This is a debt. This is an obligation that never ever goes away. You can pay your obligation for taxes theoretically. Although they keep coming back. You can, you can pay your obligations and, and show respect to someone. But you will never ever get out of the debt that you have to love one another. This word here, one another. This word here, each other. And what you have is a very clear sense that Paul is saying absolutely every single person that you encounter, you have a debt to. You walk into an office building, there is a receptionist there. You've never seen this receptionist before in your life. You have a debt to that receptionist. Every single person that you email or text, every single person that you post about in social media where it's clear that you have a point in mind, but you're just vague enough that you can be plausibly deniable that you actually meant that person. Do we do that? Paul says you have a debt to that person. You are in debt to that person. And that debt is a debt of love. And there are no exceptions and there are no excuses. You and I have an ongoing obligation to everyone that we meet. It is a debt that is never paid up. 
And our lives must be dominated by that truth. Paul is saying our lives must be dominated by the fact that every single person that we encounter is a person we are in debt to, and that debt is only paid by loving them. Now, there are two reasons that we have this debt and that we need to pay it. And the first reason is because it is the righteous life, and this is exactly what he starts to explain at the very end of verse 8. For the one who loves another, this is the reason, has fulfilled the law. This word fulfilled means that you have accomplished the purpose. He is saying if you love one another, you have accomplished the purpose of the law. Verse 9 shows what law he's talking about. He's not talking about the law of government authorities that we saw from last week's passage. He's talking about the law that God set out in the Old Testament with his people. And we know this because these commands that he gives here are straight out of the, straight out of the Ten Commandments. They are most of, but not all of, the commands that you find in the Ten Commandments for how we are to, re- how we are to treat one another. But just in case we have any idea that Paul was like leaving things out because we're not obligated to that, or that's not part of what's being covered here, he throws this in, and any other commandment anywhere that God has given, it's all covered. All of it's included. And the reason that we, that we accomplish the goal or the purposes of the law through love is right here in the second part of verse 9. He quotes Leviticus 19. And he says, this line from that you shall love your neighbor as yourself sums up every commandment. That word sums up means to take all of the, of the details, all the different parts of something, all the little pieces of something, and bring it together. So he's saying that, that, that statement in Leviticus 19, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. That statement takes every command that God has given about how we treat one another and it brings them together and it, and it fulfills all of them. How does it do that? How can that statement do that? That's his explanation in verse 10. Because if you really love one another, you're not going to hurt each other. You're not going to sin against each other. And therefore, love, same word he used up here, accomplishes the purposes of the law. Now, there is a group of people that are sitting here this morning that they're drawing a conclusion from that part of this passage. And here's the conclusion they are drawing. They are drawing the conclusion of, I sin against people all the time, and I hurt them. Does that mean I don't love anyone. And they will start beating themselves up. Here's what Paul is doing in this passage. Paul is trying to make the point not of what happens when love breaks down. He is trying to make the point of what happens when love works well. When love works well, our automatic responses to one another will be to treat one another righteously. We will fulfill the commands of the law. That's his point. Paul knows perfectly well that none of us are going to love perfectly this side of heaven because none of us will live perfectly righteously this side of heaven. So the first reason that that Paul gives that we need to pay our debt of love to one another is because that is what the heart of the righteous life is. That is how you fulfill the purpose, the point, the goal of the righteous life. The second reason that Paul gives is because this is the urgent life. Besides you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. He is referring to something that we, um, t- 
take for granted that they would not have. That's not the right way of saying it. What he's referring to is the fact that in their culture, in their society, they didn't have electricity, right? Now, that's not specifically what Paul is referring to, but they didn't have lights. So here's how people lived in that time. They would wake up well before dawn. If you woke up at dawn, you're getting up late. They would wake up well before dawn because they wanted to be prepared and ready to go. As soon as dawn hit, they needed to make the absolute most they could make of the daylight that they would have. So they would be up well before dawn, well before light would come. And he is saying this spiritually in in the moment of God's salvation history is where we are at. We are at that hour where the light is coming and you must be up and you must be ready. Makes a statement. Salvation is nearer to us now than we first believed. That sounds weird to our ears because we tend to think of salvation as I made a decision to become a Christian, so I'm saved and I have salvation. Why would it be coming near if I already have it? Um, That's not how Paul talks about salvation throughout his writings. It's even broader than Paul. Salvation has three components to it in the New Testament. Salvation is that moment where you say, I repent of my sins, I believe of Jesus, and I have committed to being a follower of Christ. And at that point, salvation means we are declared right with God. Everything that we have ever done or will ever do, we are declared not guilty and forgiven, and we are saved from the penalty of that sin that has dominated our lives. That's the first way that Paul means salvation. The second way that you see salvation in the, uh, in the New Testament is we are in the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. That is a lifetime process. And we are being saved from a life that is dominated by sin that has once enslaved us but no longer enslaves us. And more and more we are getting freed from the sin. And that is a process that is referred to as salvation in the New Testament. And then there's a third way that the word salvation is used and it's the way that it's used right here. It's the one day. Whether it's the day when Jesus comes back or it's the day that you die, you are going to stand in front of the Lord and you are going to be declared, you are going to be made into the person that you have been slowly developing into throughout your lifetime. You are going to be just like Jesus. You are going to see Jesus without any of the taints of sin and you will be just like like him and that is the ultimate salvation and that is what Paul is saying is getting nearer and nearer the the, the the day of the Lord coming back the day that you will see him fully the day that you will finally be completely like him is becoming nearer and nearer and because that day is coming there is a way that you should not live and there's a way that you should live you should not live As if it is still night. You should not live as if Jesus is not coming soon. And he ties that. With we need to not live. In immorality. But we must live. As if the light is at hand. As if the light is here. As if it's daylight. And and the blessings of daylight are actually upon us. And what does that mean? We must Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We must become more and more like him. And we do that in part by not giving the sinful desires, the sinful temptation, any room to work. What Paul is describing here is a life that is lived urgently. A life that recognizes that Jesus is just around the corner. And because Jesus is just around the corner, I need to live in the way that reflects that he is so near. 
And so we put on Jesus by becoming like him, by taking on his character, by loving what he loved, and by loving how he loved. And we don't give our sinful lives room to work. Have you noticed, um, not surprisingly, on social media, how many people are talking about, now that it's 2020, uh, Jesus is coming soon? Here's what Paul would say to that. Yes, yes, that's right. That's exactly how you have to think. Jesus is coming soon. And so because that is true, you must live urgently because this world is running out of time. How do you live urgently? You must live righteously. How do you live righteously? You love one another. That's his point there. We have a debt to one another. And that debt is grounded in the fact that to love one another is what it looks like to fulfill everything that God has commanded to. And we have a debt or we have a responsibility to fulfill our debt to love one another because that's what it actually means to live urgently in the face of the reality that Jesus is coming. It's great to post on Facebook that Jesus is coming soon and reminding all of us that that is true. But Paul would say the most important thing you must do is you must love one another. So now we need to define the term that we have used a lot this morning, that we will use a lot every single day, but we never really think about what does it actually mean. And that is the word love. And I have found this chart, and if you've been around for a while, you've seen this chart before. And if you stay around for a while, you're going to see this chart a lot. I have found this chart incredibly, incredibly helpful. It's based on pulling together different aspects of Scripture. Uh, You're not going to find this any particular place in Scripture. Um, And it's also, frankly, based on a bunch of really bright Christian people over the years who have reflected on what does Scripture say. Um, And here's what they've come up with. Biblical love really comes down to two different components. There is a desire for unity with one another and a desire for the good of one another. Now, the problem is there are lots of relationships in the world where they live on this end of the chart, where everything about the relationship, everything about this person's understanding of love is, I want to be united with you, I want to be intimate with you, I want to be close to you, but they have this much desire for the good of that other person. There is a classic example of that in great American literature. The Grinch... You think about how the Grinch relates to his dog, Max. He loves having Max around. He wants Max around all the time. He does not care for one second what is good for Max. Max has one role in his life, and that is to meet the Grinch's needs. You would be astounded to know how many people walk into my office because they're in relationships that are just like that. They're in relationships with people who, I want you in my life, I want to be near to you, I want to be close to you, but it's all about what you do for me. And that is a highly, highly dysfunctional form of love because it does not at all factor in the good of the other person. Now, there's another extreme that lives right down here. That is all about the good of the other person. But you don't care about relationship with them at all. And this may sound like it's, you know, that's not too bad. But that actually is extremely damaging itself. Have you ever felt like you were someone's project? That's that type of dysfunction of love at work. It's, it's what I might call Hollywood charity. 
right? Hollywood charity, and this is, this, I'm grossly overgeneralizing, plenty of exceptions to this. Hollywood charity is, is that celebrity that says, I care deeply about the homeless people. Let me give them money, but you better not have anyone get anywhere near me. I don't even want to know their name. I don't want to know anything about them. Heaven forbid that you allow them anywhere into my life. Celebrity charity may be a better way of saying that. It's the person who looks at the poor and says, I want what is good for you, but I will never, ever allow you anywhere near me. Now, our instinct when we think about this is to try to live right here in the middle with this perfect balance of unity and good. But there's a problem with this. When you try to live in that perfect balance, you end up drawing guardrails. You end up putting walls and you will say, for me to have the perfect balance, I will only have this much unity with this individual and I will go no further. And I'll be very careful that I don't give too much. Does that make sense? That is not how God loves us. Here's what God does. God takes this, and he takes this, complete 100% desire for unity, complete 100% desire for good, and he takes that sheet and he puts them together. And he says, I completely, without qualification, without question, without any way watering down, I am completely committed to intimacy and nearness and closeness to you, and I will do whatever it takes to get that. And I am at the same time, without compromise, 100%, completely uncontaminated, unwatered down, committed to your good and whatever it takes to give that to you. And that's what Christian love is supposed to look like and add to that what God did to pursue both unity with us and our good as he sacrificed his son. What Christian love looks like is a complete desire for unity with the other person, a complete desire for their good at the same time, and the willingness to sacrifice to get there. That is what Christian love looks like. That is what Paul is calling to us to in this passage. It is a 100% commitment to unity with the other and a 100% commitment to the good of the other. And the reason I found this chart incredibly helpful is because it, it gave me two questions that I could ask of any and every relationship that is around me. How do I move towards greater unity with that person and how do I pursue their good? It's a great question to think about for every person. If you lead a small group in your small group, how do you pursue greater unity with that person? How do you pursue their good? Every person in your family, personal family, extended family, every person at work, every person at school, every waiter that you come across. Let me remind you of this chart I introduced two weeks ago. It is a fantastic exercise to go through this chart and say, in my marriage... How do I pursue unity with that other person? How do I pursue the next step of unity, deeper unity? And maybe what it's going to be is we need some designated time alone without kids, without distractions of technology or whatever. How do I pursue the good for that person? Well, maybe the next step is saying, what is it that, that helps my spouse accomplish what she just loves to do or he loves to do? How do I help them get more time to do what helps them flourish? Let's go to another extreme. What about the casual relationships that we have? What does it look like to think this way if you go out to lunch today and you encounter a waiter or a waitress? What does the unity look like because you don't know this person? Well, unity is, what does it mean for me to show that I care about this person as a person and not just as a waiter? It might be just asking them a question or two about their lives. It's one of the reasons, by the way, that when I noticed tattoo, asked the question, is there a story behind that tattoo? Because usually if someone is going to put artwork on, they have a reason. Not always, but, but very often they have a reason. And it's a very simple way 
to just enter into their world and say, is there a story behind the artwork that you have? Um, it's remarkable what you will learn. It is remarkable. How do you pursue the good of a waiter or waitress? Well, don't be a source of stress. Um, Ann and I like to tell wait staff that we will be their lowest maintenance table of the day. That we make that our goal. We will be your lowest maintenance table of the day. They may never see us again. But that's what it looks like with someone you may never see again to pursue love, to pursue unity, and to pursue goodness. You should note that there are different levels of pursuing unity and goodness. What it looks like for me to pursue this in a marriage is very different from what it looks like for me to pursue this with a waiter or waitress. And the reason that's important to remember is because some of you are also sitting here thinking, I am in or I have been in an abusive relationship where someone has used a passage just like that to tell me that I must endure this abuse. What someone who is an abuser is doing is they are like the Grinch with Max. They want unity with you, but they don't care about your good. And they will make you sacrifice for their good. Um, as someone who has worked on the board of the Women's Center of East Texas for 15 years and has been the president three times, I'm going to tell you, get out. Get out. The appropriate form of unity with a person who is an abuser is a very much arm's length unity. I have probably three or four people in my life, in my entire lifetime, that I have said, you are someone that I must absolutely keep at arm's length because you are unsafe. So my unity, I can think of a person right now that I have not had contact with in about 20 years, and I'll be happy if I don't have contact with for another 20 years. And my, what unity for me looks like with him is I will do nothing ever to further a rift in the relationship, to harm him, to do anything other than, than desire a closeness that is as safe as it can be. And for me, desiring the, the good of this person is I will never do anything to damage them. I will pray for this person, and I do pray for this person, and I pray for this person's well-being, but I do not interact with him on Facebook. I do not interact with him if he ever reaches out to me because he is someone who is toxically unsafe. Just to explain the level I'm talking about, this is someone who once said that he had his intention to break up certain marriages in our church, not this church, this is in Oregon. By sleeping with spouses. Um, so I just want you to think. This wasn't just a random. Guy said a bean thing to me one time. This guy made it his goal. To break up marriages. Including mine. Um, so yeah. I, unity with him looks very different. From unity with someone in here. Very different. I still desire a safe unity with him. But it's going to look very different. It's interesting to me as we think about what is the passage to identify. This or the principle to identify. This principle is a principle we've already stated in the book of Romans. It's not in, in chapter 8. You cannot separate love from righteousness. This is a principle that is all over the New Testament. And I will probably bring it out every single time that we encounter it. Because this is a principle that is so easy for us to get wrong. We so easily think that I can be righteous by just checking off all of these boxes. I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray, I, I, I uh, give to the poor, I give to the church. Look at these things that I do, and yet we treat the people around us 
horribly. It's an incredibly easy principle to miss. And so we need to be reminded again and again and again that if you want to understand the nature of righteousness, you have to enter in to the desire for unity with one another and the desire for good of one another. When I was in college, I heard a pastor say one time, and this has stuck with me ever since. He said, if you want to assess your walk with God, ask yourself how well you're loving others. And in the years since college, which have been way too many, I still think he's right. I think that's what Paul is saying again and again, including right here. If you want to assess the true nature of your walk with God, assess how well you are loving one another. There is a debt that we owe. And that debt is the key to the righteous life and the urgent life. It is the debt to love one another. What does it mean to love one another? It means given what is appropriate in the nature of the relationship we have with this person. From a waitress to a spouse, how do I pursue greater unity? How do I pursue the greater good of that person? Paul's point when he wrote this letter to the, or when he wrote this passage to the Romans, to the original audience, was to say, you must look for ways to pay your obligation to love others. And that's an obligation that will never go away. As we think about what's the implication for us 2,000 years later, it's that the pursuit of righteousness starts with love. The pursuit of righteousness starts with, with the desire for unity and good for one another. Rosh Hashanah, which is happening this weekend, was also called the Feast of Trumpets. And that's because at different times over the course of this weekend, what they will do is they will blow trumpets, and that will be followed by times of prayer and feasting and other things. But trumpets are a central part to the celebration. Well, that sounds weird. Why do you have trumpets as a part of that? Because a trumpet in Israel, in ancient Israel, was what you used to warn the people that danger is coming. And it's what you would use to tell the people, you must now immediately assemble the army. And if you're not in the army, you must get to safety. You must prepare yourselves for battle. And so every year, the people of Israel would come together at this time. And they would blow trumpets and they would say, there is a new year coming. Prepare for the spiritual battles that are ahead of us. And the way that we do that, the way that Paul is calling us to do that today, is to take seriously that we have an obligation to love others, and that this is the very heart of the righteous life and the urgent life. Some suggestions for how to put this into practice today. Again, just to get scripture deeper into our hearts and into our minds, that the transformed life comes from the renewal of our mind and rewriting these passages in our own words helps us with the renewal of our mind. I'm going to encourage you to, to identify five people. Use the chart that I had up there of types of relationships. or you know, I'd strongly encourage you to create your own chart and, and pick five of them and take five minutes for each person, you can take two minutes for each person and ask the question, how do I pursue greater level of unity with that person? How do I pursue greater level of good for that person? Take the time to answer those questions and to begin to act on them. And then for each of those five people that you identified, take time every single day this week and pray that God will deepen your love for those people. There is a reason we always include prayer as an application. That is because if I ever end up sending the, mess, sending the message inadvertently that what you must do in the Christian life is run out of here, grit your teeth, and try harder, I have only set you up for frustration and failure. What you must do is fall before the Lord and ask for his help as you try harder, 
then he is the one who will empower you. We are going to do a baptism here in a second. I'm going to close this in prayer, and then we're going to take 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes, that will give people time to go pick up their children from kids' ministry and then come back. And here's what we're going to ask people to do because we need to maintain social distancing. Um, if you're part of the family of the person getting baptized, uh, by all means, you are welcome to go outside and watch the baptism. And, and Or if you're part of a, you know, a really close friend, by all means, do that. But to assure that they have enough room for social distancing, we're going to ask those that are not part of family or close friends to stay in here, and we'll broadcast it up here. So that will help us keep social distancing in both places. So let me close in prayer. And then we will take a 10-minute break so we can get children, and then we will start the baptism. Father, we thank you so much that you love us so much that despite all of our sin and ugliness and fallenness, you have pursued complete intimacy with us, and you have, com have pursued the absolute best and good for us even at the sacrificial expense of your son. And Lord, what you call us to in this passage is to take that same type of love and show it to one another. And by that, we fulfill the purposes of the law and we live a life that sees the coming of your son as just around the corner. Lord, we cannot do that on our own strength. And so we ask you to work in us and through us by the power of your spirit to be people who love the way that you loved us. And Lord, as we move into baptism, we are celebrating that these people have publicly declared they have committed their lives to repenting from sin, believing that Jesus is who he said he is, the son of God, did what he said that he would do, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and then was raised three days later. And Lord, that their lives will be committed to becoming more like Jesus. May we support them and help them in that journey, and may they be a model for us of what this passage has called us to. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So take about 10 minutes. And